giving this talk. All right, so I'll jump right into it. So my talk is about um, completed K-theory and equivariant elliptic cohomology. And it's going to be construction of equivariant elliptic cohomology that's going to be actually pretty similar in a, in a lot of respects to um, what Charles was doing in the last talk, except that instead of using ordinary cohomology at the end, I'll be using K-theory. Um, and so things will be a little bit different uh, in that regard. But let me um, back up a little bit. So the motivation comes from a paper of Kitschlu and Morava, where they give a, a construction of non-equivariant um, elliptic cohomology at the Tate curve. And it's a, it's a wonderfully simple idea. What they do is, well, you want to define or construct um, elliptic cohomology at the Tate curve for some space X. What you do is you can you take uh, the free loop space of your space X, um, and then that has a, an action by S1, which rotates these loops. And so you can look at the equivariant K theory of the loop space. Now, as Charles mentioned in his talk, um, things like this won't be cohomology theories because um, taking maps from a, something, some fixed thing into a space won't preserve um, cofiber sequences. But the trick is that after you take this S1 equivariant K theory, um, you complete it at a certain ideal and you complete it at the ideal generated by Q. So you let, um, so um, the representation ring of S1 of which this thing is a module over, it's uh, Laurent polynomials and some variable that I'll call Q. And um, what we can do is complete in positive power. So we can, we can ask that um, our Laurent polynomials be unbounded in the positive direction. And um, this turns out to be a cohomology theory, basically because of uh, the localization theorem that um, Charles mentioned in his talk. Um, this, this expression will localize to the fixed point locus of this S1 action on the loop space, which is the constant loops, which is just the space X itself. So this thing is actually a sort of fancy way of just taking the ordinary regular K theory of X and considering Laurent polynomials with coefficients in the K theory of X. But the point is that this thing comes with a natural complex orientation because uh, we've built it using complex K theory that has a nice idea about Shapiro orientation, which has tons of good properties. Um, and so you get a formal group law and that's the Tate formal group law. Um, and what you've got is a, is a nice, super short geometric presentation of elliptic cohomology at the Tate curve. Right, it's geometric because K-theory itself is geometric. It has to do with vector bundles. So now you're dealing with something like the Laurent series of values and vector bundles. So over this ring, the, the Tate curve, um, the formal group law is isomorphic to the added one. So um, from the point of view of chromatic homotopy theory, you haven't done anything super interesting uh, because some of the multiplicative formal group law is easy enough to understand. But the point is you've given a geometric construction of it, and that's the that's the nice part. Uh, the, the other thing that's good is that the Tate curve is, oh, wait, sorry, this is the bad part. Uh, let me reiterate what I'm saying. What I just said is that the Tate curve is only a very small part of the moduli of elliptic curves, right? It's this, uh, it's like a neighborhood of this point infinity if you're looking at the um, J invariant. Um, So in terms, of, in terms of TMF or something, you're not doing much. You're only looking at a very small part of the moduli. <clears throat> but this part of the moduli um, is a good representative for the complex moduli. It has, it has the, a very similar sort of uniformization. So given that there's this very simple Kishlub-Morava construction of uh, elliptic homology at the Tate curve, <clears throat> the natural question is, well, can we do the um, Kishlub-Morava construction equivariantly? Um, and if we can do that, then we would have something that we could call um, equivariant elliptic cohomology at the Tate curve. Um, <clears throat> and moreover, if we can really do the Kitchell-Morava construction equivariantly, we would have an integral definition of equivariant elliptic cohomology, which, in at least in good cases, or one would hope, would refine the definitions of Kronjowski and Kitchell that Charles mentioned in his talk, which are defined over the complex numbers. And the short answer, which is what the rest of the talk will be about, is that yes, you can do uh, the kitchlub morava construction equivalently, um, but it does take a little bit of care to get it right. 
But once you do get it right, it has all the properties that you might want. So that's sort of the, uh, the setting of this talk. So the goal for the rest of the talk, I will outline a construction that deserves to be called um, the equivariant Kitchler-Morava construction. And uh, it will produce an equivariant cohomology theory. And I wanna highlight some main features <clears throat> that I think make it interesting. So the first is that this equivariant cohomology theory, EG, will be defined for an arbitrary compact Lie group. Um, moreover, it's coefficient ring. So if you take the uh, G equivariant cohomology of a point, this coefficient ring will be such that no prime is invertible in that ring. That's basically saying I'm doing things integrally. I'm not um, sort of tensoring at the complex numbers or the rationals or anything like that, um, which is uh, sort of a, a refinement in some sense. The second thing that this thing uh, will have is it will admit twists by elements of uh, degree four cohomology of the class main space of BG. And these are the twists that uh, Charles was trying to build into his formulas. So this thing will, will be twistable. The third condition is sort of a compatibility with the non-equivariant Kitchen-Morava. I want to assert that when I take the trivial group, I recover the Kitchen-Morava theory. That's sort of uh, clear that I'd want that. And then the fourth thing um, is also kind of important, is actually maybe one of the most important in, in my eyes, the fourth and fifth together. So this construction that I'm going to give, it will not represent reference positive energy representation theory of the loop group in any way. Um, and why do I desire that? Well, because number five, I want to say that a fortiori, so once you've given this definition, you can then prove that there is a natural map from positive energy level tau representations of LG to co-cycles for this theory. And this induces an isomorphism from um, the Grodny group of isomorphism classes of these representations to um, the twisted cohomology of a point. And so the reason I ask this is because there are previous constructions um, that also give sort of an isomorphism like this, but uh, the positive energy representation theory of LG is sort of used in the definition of the cohomology theory, e.g. So I find uh, Desideratum five somehow makes it a little bit stronger so you can give a, what will be a purely topological definition of this cohomology theory. And then you can go on and prove that this topological thing will classify positive energy representations. Uh, let me mention that this, this is sort of uh, exactly an analogy with, if anyone's familiar with Fried Hopkins Telemann theory on loop groups and twist K theory, there they have like, non-completed K-theory, just regular K-theory. Um, they take a purely topologically defined twisted K-theory of some quotient groupoid, and they get a ring that happens to be isomorphic to a positive energy representation. And that's sort of the thing I want to do here is have pure topology on one side and related to representation theory on the other side, as opposed to use positive energy representation theory in my definition for the cohomology theory. OK. So let me leave this up for a second. Those are the five things that I want to uh, sort of make clear that what I'm doing today does. All right. So let me get into the construction. So the guiding idea is, <clears throat> well, is to try to mimic the Kitschul-Morava construction as closely as we can. Um, and well, what would that look like? Well, we wanna do it equivariantly. So we're gonna start with uh, our space X and it has a G action by some compact Lie group. To apply the Kitschul-Morava construction, what we'd be doing is applying the non-equivariant Kitschul-Morava construction to let's say the quotient group Y. And what did they, kitchen moreover construction consistent and say, it was like, okay, well, let's replace our thing by its free loop space. So let's suppose we have some notion of the free loop space of a quotient group point. The next thing we do 
is take its S1 equivariant K theory, right? Um, then the Kitchumarava construction said, let's take that S1 equivariant K theory and complete it in positive Q powers. So one thing you could say is, another way to phrase the completion is that you're tensoring this thing, which is a Laurent polynomial module up to Laurent series. Okay. Um, <clears throat> that would be one definition of what this third thing means. And now, oh yeah, so let me skip down to, yeah, let me skip down to right here. So at this point, we could really just do what I, oh, actually, no, no, no sorry, sorry, sorry. Um, let me continue. My notes. So let's try to, let's try to implement this um, construction. So already part one would take a little bit of care. What do we mean by um, the free loop space or whatever, free loop groupoid of a quotient groupoid? Um, so let's do that. So the first thing I need to define for you is what I mean by a BZ groupoid. And you might be wondering why I'm talking about BZ groupoids. Um, basically, I need sort of the, the homotopical notions to work correctly. BZ, as you know, is homotopy equivalent to S1, uh, which is the same S1 as this S1. But somehow when I'm working with groupoids, I don't want the, the strict sort of topological group S1. I just want the sort of homotopy equivalent thingy uh, BZ and work with that thing. So I make this definition, a BZ groupoid. Oh, and all, all groupoids in this talk will be implicitly topological groupoids. So they'll have a topological space of objects and a topological space of morphisms and all maps will be continuous. So BZ groupoid is such a topological groupoid uh, together with an alpha. So it's a pair of a topological groupoid and an alpha. And what is alpha? Alpha is an automorphism of the identity functor. So it's a choice for every object in my groupoid, an automorphism of that object. That, uh, that automorphism needs to be central for this thing to be an automorphism of the identity factor. And since we're working in the topological setting, this will be a continuous choice. So this is some of the homotopical notion of an S1 action is the, is the way to think about it. <laughs> And the main example that we're gonna be dealing with is as follows. So we can take um, a manifold or a topological space, M, let it have a G action. And then we can define the loop groupoid to be um, the topological groupoid whose objects are the space of pairs of a point in my manifold and an element in my group such that the element, the, the group element fixes the point in the manifold. And now I can take this topological space and consider the quotient group void by the group G, where G acts by this formula. So G acts by its given action on the M factor and by conjugation on the G factor. That's what I'm going to define to be the loop group void of my quotient group void. And I claim this is a BZ group void. And the BZ action is sort of the tautological thing that it wants to be. Um, the component of my automorphism of the identity functor at an object M comma G is the group element G. So this is the, the groupoid version um, of the free loop space of M considered with its G action. Okay, now that I have BZ groupoids, I wanna be able to take the quotient by this BZ action. So let me define what that is. So the BZ quotient of a BZ groupoid um, is another groupoid. It has the same space of objects as my original groupoid in a different space of morphisms. The space of morphisms is, well, I'm sort of adding in um, 
an S1 worth of morphisms. But contrary to what you might initially think that I'm adding in sort of a, an S1 in a fiber, like a, an S1 bundle over my original space of morphisms, I'm going to add it sort of under. So I'm going to have my original space of morphisms be a bundle over S1. Um, and this is sort of this is sort of a general way that quotients will work. Is the, the group which is acting is going to be the base of some exact sequence, which we'll get to in a second. But here's the here's a cold hard definition. I take my space of morphisms, I cross it with the real numbers, and then I quotient out by the integers. Um, oh, I should note that in my talk, most of my quotient slashes will mean um, take the groupoid quotient, what some people write as double quotient. But since most of them are double quotients and it would be a lot of slashes, I'll just take a single slash to mean the group weight quotient. And then if it really means the classical quotient, I'll say it. So here I really do mean the classical quotient. It's a free action. Um, so I have this original space of morphisms. I add a real line and then a quotient by Z. And the action is this. I take at a morphism and a real number. I sort of, I say that Changing the real number by n is the same thing as changing the morphism by this automorphism in the source. Okay, and um, I won't go over it in the talk, but um, let me just sort of tell you that this is sort of, this is the right definition. The this notion of BZ quotient has the properties that a quotient should have. Okay, so I've in my Kishlu Murava construction, I've got a lot of the things I need. I've got the um, the thing I want to take the place of the free loop space. It's some groupoid. So now I could really do the second step. I could look at its S1 equivariant K theory. And by this, I mean the following. I could take uh, my manifold with a G action, turn it into its quotient groupoid, Take its loop space in the sense considered above, which is a BZ groupoid. Take the BZ quotient, that's another topological groupoid, and then take its K theory in the sense of Fried Hopkins and Telemann. Um, they give a definition of K theory that's um, functorial enough or whatever to, uh, to apply to a very large class of topological groupoids, of which this is one. So I can just plug it into this machine. I'll get some kind of K theory. It will be a module over the. Whoop, it will be a module over the representation ring of S1, just for abstract reasons. This BZ will turn into like a strict S1 um, once you take the homotopy groups of whatever you're taking the homotopy groups of. And then I can do this sort of what I'll call na the naive completion positive powers. I can tensor from Laurent polynomials to Laurent series. Okay. And that, I mean, that is one attempt you might make at doing the kitchen of construction equivariant. <clears throat> um, but there's problems with this. And let me just mention a couple. So the first one is that it won't give the expected answer, um, which the expected answer is this thing that Paul Charles mentioned. This is that there should be some relation to the positive energy representation through loops groups. And while well, you can calculate this, in fact, Fried Hopkins and Telemann in their loop groups and twisted K theory papers, they do exactly this. They calculate this thing. And the problem is that this thing, while it does have to do with the positive energy representation theory of loop groups, um, they calculate it in the case that M is a point. So you do get something that's related to um, representation theory of loop groups, but there's this weird shift in degree and twisting. So I'm sort of backgrounding the twisting in a lot of this, but um, you always want to have a twist in there. And the problem that happens when you do this definition is that twists and the, the degree end up not working right. And it's like, it's, it's weird and annoying and it's only a small difference. So you might think, you know, well, who cares? Just, just in your definition somewhere, shift the degree and shift the twist and then you're done. But somehow like this, this little annoying shift is, is an indicator that you're not doing things sort of the way they should be done or whatever you're doing things that um, aren't as canonical as you might want. Oh, so here so this case theory, this case theory is a twisted case theory by FHT, right? 
So twist, twist, twist. That's right. Yeah, I'm. I okay. we can write we can write little twists here. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So the in the um, Friedhoff's Talmud formulation, you can always sort of absorb the twist into the groupoid. And well, yeah. I don't, yeah, everything, everything in my talk will be implicitly twisted or at least twistable. Right, so the first problem is this thing is not, uh, <clears throat> is not quite going to match up with the expected, uh, the expected outcome. For example, it won't match up with what Gronowski did even when you complexify because you'll get a representation ring of, of the loop root, but it's going to be at the wrong level. Okay, the second problem is that there is an existing definition of Becker elliptic homology, I think due to Mike Hopkins. And in a lot of cases, the thing I've written here as it stands won't satisfy that. And usually it won't satisfy that for sort of silly reasons, which are these things I mentioned actually, they're sort of a sub, it's a sub piece of item one, which is that the expected group ends up in the wrong uh, degree. And so sometimes you'll have, um, a cohomology theory where uh, the, the degree zero cohomology of a point is empty. And of course, there's not going to be a lot of, not empty, it's zero. Uh, there's not going to be a lot of um, elliptic curves uh, over the zero, right? So point two is kind of silly, but again, it's sort of indicating that you're doing something not quite right. Point three uh, is maybe not a problem in itself, but in uh, sort of, um, a way to halfway diagnose problems one and two. The problem is that you're doing this completion in positive Q powers too algebraically, right? We're doing this sort of a brutal completion at the end. We're taking the regular K theory, everything's sort of fine until the very end, we just say, okay, I'm forcing Laurent series onto this, onto this thing. And somehow that's, that's the thing that you sh should have in your mind is the, what's going wrong and what's causing problems one and two. Um, and problem four is also related to problem one. Problems one and two, it's maybe a more precise version, uh, precise statement about problem one. It's that positive energy representations of the loop group won't obviously give co-cycles. So while there will be some sort of abstract or hard to, hard to find isomorphism between this and some ring of positive energy representations, it's not super clear how you get from positive energy representation to a co-cycle for this theory. Basically, what you'd have to do is go through it through the entire paper of Fried Hopkins and Telemann and their sort of Dirac operator story to get a cosigner, which one would hope is. Yeah. So, Kieran, will you explain each of these moral problems in the, in the next page or later? Um, not really. If, if you want me to say more about them, now might be the time. Okay, so I have some questions. So one is I wonder why we have the first problem. Then why the, uh, it does not give the expected answer relates to the positive energy representation of the loop group. I wonder why. Yeah, why? and I also wonder, yeah, maybe a more ex explanation about the second one also. Yeah, I think also maybe some explanation of the at least the first three. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> let me let me start with the first one. So why why doesn't it give the right answer? So either that question is really deep and I don't know the answers. Well, well, no, I think I, I think I have a decent explanation for for why it doesn't give the right answer. So um. Now I'm wondering whether I should table your question and answer it later once I have a few more notational things on the table. Yeah, let me let me answer your questions as I go. Let me just say right now that the, the answer to your question, why does it not give the, oh, let me give a partial answer to you. Let me tell you exactly how, not why, but how it's not the right answer. How about that? And then later in the talk, I'll tell you the reason I think why it's not the right answer. So the problem is that the Fried Hopkins Telemann calculation tells you that, um, so first let's say it's so the expectation is that the tau twisted equivariant elliptic cohomology 
of a point in degree zero. The expectation is that this should be um, positive energy representation ring at level tau of LG. Okay, that's the expectation. <clears throat> now the problem with with the definition to the left, which you can't see right now, but is that it will give that tau LG zero point. Um, actually, let me do this. Tau LG star. Let's make it, eh, let's give it zero. Tau LG star will be the positive energy representation rate of, it's either plus or minus some sigma. Oh, you need the usual disclaimer here so that things are easier to state. G simple, simply connected. Okay. Here, this is some extra twist. Associated to loops on the dual of the Lie algebra. Okay. So my claim is that if you do this um, this definition here, what you will find is this over here. Basically, just because you're reading off um, the results of Friedel Hopkins and Telemann, you'll find that the tau twisted elliptical homology of a point will be the tau, let me choose a, make a choice. I think it's gonna be tau minus sigma. Is gonna be the tau minus sigma. Yeah, I think that's right. It's gonna be the tau minus sigma representation ring of LG. And it's gonna be in this weird dimension. Okay. Yeah. And so the expectation is gonna be sort of messed up. For example, if the dimension of G is odd, which it is for like the, the best group to always be thinking about is SU2. Um, already for SU2, things are going to be bad. It's going to be concentrated in degree one. Nothing's going to be in degree zero. Um, and it's going to be sort of the wrong twist. Okay. And so later in the talk, I will give you my version of the answer for why that's happening. And the vague, the vague answer right now is this. Why is it happening? It's because the completion was done two algebraically. <clears throat> we'll, have a, we'll do a different version of completion, which will fix the issue. So let me go through this fix, and then I can answer Jen's question better. Okay, so some more sort of wishy-washy uh, intuitive words about what I'm about to do is instead of doing this completion by just tensoring up at the end, I'm gonna do the completion locally or before taking K theory or at the level of cosine. So what I'm gonna do is instead of taking K theory, which is like something that has to do with finite dimensional vector bundles over my base object that I'm studying and then take, and then tensoring after I take, you know, um, stable isomorphism classes, what I'm gonna do is change the cosine, change the type of vector bundles I'm looking at. Um, before I start looking at isomorphism classes or stable isomorphism classes of them, and then hopefully get a different answer. And so the idea here is that I'm going to change the finite dimensionality condition, which is the condition you put when you're doing regular uh, classical topological K theory. What I'm going to do is now that I have this sort of S1 action lurking around, I have these, you know, I'm looking at these loop groupoids. They're not really S1 groupoids, but they have this BZ action. I'm going to try to use that action to put some conditions on my vector bundles. First, it'll allow them to be a little more general, but allow them to be um, not too general so they don't get something crazy. And the way that I'm gonna do that, hit that sweet spot is with this S1 action. So let me recall the definition of this BZ groupoid. So for a general groupoid um, with a BZ action, that's X, 
I defined this busy quotient, which was the same set of objects, same space, topological space of objects, and a little beefed up morphism space. And the way I defined it, there's a there's a sequence of groupoids from X mapping to its busy quotient, mapping to the busy quotient of a point. And the busy quotient of a point uh, you'll find has an R mod Z space of morphisms. So it deserves to be called point mod BZ. And in this case, BZ is being modeled by R mod Z, which is like the honest circle S1, right? like as a group. Okay. And so if I take this sequence and look at it at a single object in X, I get a short exact sequence of groups, of regular topological groups. And that goes like this. I have for an object X in the original groupoid, I have its automorphisms in the groupoid X. And I have its automorphisms in the groupoid in the BZ quotient. And then I have the S1. And this is a short exact sequence. So now you see the thing that I sort of alluded to before is that what I've done when I took this BZ quotient is I added an S1, but I added it in the base of a short exact sequence so that there isn't really a canonical S1 sitting in um, this group. To, to sort of choose an S1 sitting in this group would amount to choosing a splitting of this short exact sequence. And so what I'm gonna do is say, okay, let me make this part precise. What do I mean by change the co-cycles of K-theory? I'm gonna say, okay, I'm gonna take the K-theory where I allow my vector bundles to be infinite dimensional, but I'm gonna do the following. I'm gonna take a section of this. That means I get a, a S1 in the stabilizer of every point. I'm gonna ask that that circle acts on the fiber of the vector bundle and decompose it into eigenspaces which are finite dimensional and bounded below. So this is sort of the Laurent, I'm asking for a Laurent series of vector bundles um, where the Laurent variable is the equivalent parameter for S1, okay? And that's basically, right, this is the non-equivalent thing of what Kitchell and Marava are doing, just sort of said in a lot of words. You're allowing, right, Kitchell and Marava was about Laurent series valued in vector bundles. I'm saying I'm doing the same thing right here, but I'm just focusing point-wise for now. And okay, great. So I've got this sort of local definition of what a co-cycle should look like. Near every point, its fiber should, once I choose an S1, it should look like a vector bundle, a finite dimensional vector, uh, Laurent series with coefficients in a finite dimensional vector bundle. Great, um, but there's a problem. The problem is that I needed to choose a splitting for every object in my group board. And um, if I choose two different splittings, the same vector bundle might fail the condition for one, but satisfy it for the other. Because the splitting might, the S1 inside here may look very different. Um, so that's a problem, which, which splitting do I choose? Um, there's an even worse problem, is that there may not be a choice of splitting, a consistent choice of splitting for all objects in my group one. So there may, may, may be no continuous choice over the whole space of objects, which means that what I'm doing isn't even well-defined. And the fix turns out to be just really simple. You say, well, actually, yeah, let me say the fix first and then give the example. Fix. It's the easiest possible fix you can think of. So you have these sort of, a condition for every choice of splitting, and it's not well defined because the conditions at different splittings uh, don't agree. You just say, okay, well, I'm going to consider vector bundles that satisfy this condition for every choice of splitting. Uh. And now that'll be well-defined. 
a priori this can this this is a definition you could make um it's a universal property type of uh condition it's a limit i'm taking an intersection of a bunch of things so a priori it's like a definition you could make but it might be really hard to work with as such definitions usually are and the upshot is this simple thing turns out to be totally calculable and will give you the answer that you want so let's do an example <clears throat> So let's take as our groupoid X, um, the groupoid you get from letting the compact Lie group U1 act on itself by conjugation, which is a trivial action. So it's a groupoid whose space of morphisms is two copies of U1, and both the source and the target map are the projection to the first factor. Now we can equip that with a BZ action. We need an automorphism of the identity functor, um, which means we need a continuous choice of automorphism for every object. And we're going to choose the identity section. So the, ob the automorphism of an object T in U1 will be T itself. And now what I claim is if you, you know, go through my definitions of what, a, what the BZ quotient is and everything, and that whole, that whole shebang, you can, you can write down the BZ quotient. And you can try to, um, you can try to find these these sections here that we needed to define what it meant for a, for a vector model to be allowable, to have, to be finite dimensional. And what you'll find is that you can choose these splittings and you can do it for like every point on your circle um, continuously. But once you come, once around the circle, um, your identification of the fiber with um, this product um, the splitting will change and it will change by a shearing map. The shearing map will be the map from U1 to U1 cross S1 to itself, which shears the this factor into the other factor. So there's this E to the R that will show up on the right. That's sort of the best you can do. That's sort of telling you the non the non-triviality of this um, of this BZ action. And so what we'll find is that um, if you work through these formulas, what we'll find is that an allowable vector bundle over this groupoid, well, it's going to be, first of all, a vector bundle of the groupoid. The groupoid, uh, the stabilizer at each point is a U1. So at each point, the fiber is a representation of U1. And at each point, there's the stabilizer R mod Z, which we've taken a section. And the point is you can trivialize the fiber and so it's going to look like um, a Laurent series with coefficients and representations of U1. Um, but the problem is that under a, this identification, it'll look like this Laurent series. But if I look at the identification that I get from going once around, when you use a phi t composed of shear, You'll get this other, let me not call the Ron series because it might not be. You'll get this other sort of um, power series in Q with coefficients in, um, in the representation ring of U1. And the point is that if these characters, if these characters are um, specifying U1 representations at each S1 eigenspace, if these characters are growing too big, this expression may, be, may become arbitrarily negative, right? It may fail to be a Laurent series. It picks up infinitely high and infinitely low negative Q powers. And that's exactly the problem that we're seeing with uh, a vector bundle failing the condition for one choice of splitting, but satisfying it for the other. And so what you find is that let me call this completed K theory KS1 zero of this X. It will consist in Laurent series let's call it F of TQ they're in Laurent polynomials in T series in Q such that 
under this sort of shearing map, which takes f of f of tq to f of tq q is basically asking that this thing is also still a little one series. It's still uh, in there. Okay. That's what that looks like. Any questions so far? Great. Okay. So, and that's that's the end of the definition, right? So I've given this um, I've given this condition that I want my vector bundles to satisfy. Let me maybe say that you know I've I haven't probably said it in the most precise way that you could. The way you make this precise is using Fredholm operators and stuff, um, which is one of the one of the usual ways to make sort of the the an omega spectrum that represents K theories to use Fredholm operators. Um, you take this definition and I claim that this, so now what's the definition? So the new def, so amended definition. Is that I define. I define, and I, there's twists that can be done that I haven't talked about. Um, so I take my, my quotient groupoid again, I take the loop groupoid, it's a BZ groupoid, I take the BZ quotient, and now instead of taking the sort of regular Friedkamp-Hopkins-Telmon twisted K theory, I take this completed twisted K theory, where I look at these vector bundles that are infinite dimensional, but have finite dimensional S1 eigenspaces for every possible choice of S1 in the stabilizer of every point. Okay. And the claim is that this satisfies all the decipherata I want. So first, let me maybe say it was clear that nowhere here did I mention the positive energy representation theory of loop groups in the definition, right? I just, I'm just taking M mod G, I'm taking some loop groupoid, taking a BZ quotient, and taking the K theory where I'm just sort of allowing vector bundles to be infinite dimensional as long as they play well with the S1 action. And now the claim is um, that you can calculate and you indeed have that. Uh, let me write it in the K theory formulation. If you take M to be a point, you indeed get, let's say in degree zero, you get the positive energy representation ring of LG. And so now let me answer Jen's question uh, from earlier. <clears throat> so why was the, the original thing, the Fried Hopkins Telemann version of K theory, the classical one that deals with finite dimensional vector bundles, why was that giving some shift? Here's my proposed answer. So positive energy, rep so yeah, let's do, let's do a warm up. So the analogy is with um, um, just regular echovic variant K theory, um, compact groups. Every, we know that the K theory, the regular equivalent K theory of point is isomorphic to the representation rate of that group, right? And how do we prove it? Or how do we maybe get our hands, wrap our heads around this? Well, this is like by definition, by definition, 
uh, elements of the representation ring of G give us co-cycles for K0 of G from point, right? Like a complex finite dimensional representation of G is by definition of the K theory, a co-cycle for the equivalent K theory of G. It's a vector bundle over a point. So we have a natural map going this way and we can try to prove that it's an isomorphism. Now, when you try to go to loop groups, you want to say something like the LG equivalent K theory point, whatever that is, is the positive energy representation of G. So first you have to say, what do you mean by the LG equivalent K theory point? Well, one thing you might mean is what I wrote above is like the K theory of the loop group of point mod G. But the problem now is that these positive energy representations, they're infinite dimensional. That's just how the representation theory works out. All these representations, unless they're trivial, are infinite dimensional. So if I'm looking at classical K theory of anything, these infinite dimensional vector spaces are gonna be, are gonna have a really hard time representing actual bundles on anything because they're too big. So what you have to do, and this is the, uh, the whole Fried Hopkins Telemann Dirac operator story is you need to come up with a very clever family of operators whose kernel and co-kernel, which act on this infinite dimensional vector space and whose kernel and co-kernel are finite dimensional. And then you say, okay, I want the kernel and co-kernel of this very nice operator I want those to be the vector bundles that these elements go to. But that somehow, that adds this whole operator in, in the whole Dirac story. And the Dirac story is one way to see, let me zoom up to where I was talking here. This extra twist, it comes directly from the Dirac story. It's um, it comes from the spinners. On the adjoint representation of the loop group, which are needed to define the Dirac operator. And the Dirac operator, as I said, in turn is needed to turn these infinite dimensional vector spaces into finite dimensional things that are K theory classes. And so that's where the dimension shift and the degree shift are coming from. It's from this need to add an operator to turn your infinite dimensional thing into something finite dimensional. The price you pay is the shift. But now, so the upshot is if you just change the definition of K theory to this completed version down here, here, Um, these positive energy representations, although they're infinite dimensional, they satisfy the conditions that you need to define a vector bundle over this thing. They have finite dimensional S1 eigenspaces. And so you get a natural map, just like in the compact case, you get a natural map going this way, which you then have, you have a chance to prove that it's an isomorphism and it turns out to be. All right, so there's 12 minutes left. Are there any other questions? Um, I was thinking maybe I could end with a, well, so is um, please take a theory of a loose space. There, there will be a difference in the scale. Sorry, could you repeat that? Um, yeah, I think the is it's a problem. Now we need to consider the twist case theory of a, a, a loop part. Uh, then the twist there is a difference in the twist. So we cannot relate it to the positive energy representation of loop group. That's a problem. Uh, I'm, I'm a little confused. So yeah, we're, we're looking at the twisted, now completed K theory of a, of a loop groupoid.
Yeah. Yeah. So I think I'm, I think I'm. For MHT is three state K theory. There is a correspondence to the rep positive energy representation, right? And now we need uh, to consider their theory of a loop group height. Then there is oh, some problem. I think I understand. So the, the, <laughs> the input groupoid is the same as an FHT. Uh, it looks different because, so I think the answer to your question is, is maybe given in by this formula. Um, the loop groupoid of point mod G, if you work through the definition I gave, is G mod G. Does that make you happy? So it is, so three times the telemon, right, is FHT is about twisted K theory of this thing. So I'm also looking at the twisted K theory of, of the same guy up to the, the BZ quotient. Now they also do the BZ quotient, but they just sort of, they say it very short at the end. They say, oh, now look, everything we've done in this paper, you could do it equivariantly for the rotation action and you get blah, blah, blah. So they also do this, but they just don't, they don't write it out. So the, the group on the inside, that's the same as an FHT. It's the type of K theory that's being applied to it that changes and what fixes the shift uh, in where, which representations appear where and how natural of a map you get from representations to cocycles. Okay, thank you. Sure, sure. All right, so there's only nine minutes left. I wanted to do a sample calculation, but I think, um, oh, I should say, I, I should apologize a bit for the not so well-prepared talk. I messed up the time change calculation and forgot to add the extra day. So I only realized I was talking today a couple of hours ago, um, but luckily I didn't miss the talk. So I was gonna do a calculation that would have been what I would have liked to do, but I didn't have the time to prepare for it. Um, let me maybe just briefly outline the calculation in words. So the way you actually end up calculating stuff with this is you work locally because locally the definition I gave for this, for this completed K theory is sort of easy enough to understand. Locally, it looks like some kind of Laurent series in ordinary K theory, ordinary equivariant K theory, plus some condition. The condition being that it satisfies the Laurent condition for all possible choices of circles, uh, of yeah, of S ones you could, of splittings you could choose. And for tori, this is easy enough to understand. And the sort of the magical comparison to loop groups is because the monodromy that, that happens when you take some non-trivial loop in the torus and look at what, hap what sort of has happened to your splitting, that turns out to be the same action or a very similar action to the action of the, um, the affine vial group on the character lattice. And that's sort of the magic the magical connection between this purely topological definition I've just given of twisted K theory and positive energy representation of loop groups is that somehow they're both controlled by some group, which turns out to be the affine vial group in the, in the um, representation theory and turns out to be some sort of group of some monodromy group in the, in the, topolo the purely topological side. Those things match up. And so you can do the do the calculation for Torah and you're sort of you sort of end up just you're doing purely topological things, but you're sort of redoing calculations that representation theorists did in the context of um, affine value groups acting on characters. And then you want to bootstrap to all compact lead groups somehow. What you do is you first add in the vial group, see how the vial group acts, and then basically you want to show that. The group for the twisted K theory group for a, a general group G sits as a sum end inside um, its maximal torus plus its five. That's the a long story made short. All right, that's the all I have for today. Um, I'm happy to take more questions. Uh, I have a question. Yes, sir. So, yeah, so um, yeah, you 
just mentioned that your uh, new definition of this completed K theory uh, takes care of the adjoint twist. So, so is there a direct way to see you know, how, how this new definition uh, takes care of this adjoint twist? Yeah, so, so I think that the way I would phrase it is that because in this definition of K-theory, I'm allowed certain infinite dimensional vector bundles, mm -hmm. I can just take a level tau representation and consider it as a vector bundle over the group that I want it to. And it's a K-theory class. And there we go. That's, that's the map this way. Why does the adjoint twist come in in the classical case? It comes in because I'm trying to go from infinite dimensional things to ordinary classical K-theory, which is about finite dimensional vector bundles. And so I'm forced to consider Fredholm operators acting right. on my infinite dimensional vector bundle. And to get the Fredholm operator that I want, I end up needing to tensor with the spin representation of the adjoint representation, which brings its twist, its adjoint twist to the story. And so I end up landing in a twisted, uh, an adjoint twisted um, positive energy representation. Right? So that's sort of my, my explanation for why the adjoint twist doesn't show up is because you don't need to do anything to these infinite dimensional vectors spaces to consider them as K-theory classes. Okay, um, so so um, in, in your definition, this um, adjoint twist um, simply doesn't show up at all in, in an obvious Correct. way, right? Correct, okay. it doesn't show up at all, no, yeah. Nothing, yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. Sure. I have a question. Is there anything written yet to look at? Yes, there is. Uh, there's a paper on the archive, but um, it's actually kind of old. Um, I'd be happy to email you the newest version, which has a lot of edits because I got referee comments that were very nice and very extensive. OK, um, sure. Um, oh, another question of mine is, why is this is an equivariant elliptic homology and what, you, what is the definition you use? Yes, uh, great question. So <clears throat> I'm not gonna remember all the, there's the definition of an equivariant elliptic homology is, is there, it's in my paper. It's not due to me, it's due to, I think, Mike Hopkins. Um, it's got a bunch of sort of things you'd want. It's probably also in Lurie's survey. Um, my claim is that it satis so in the paper I show my thing satisfies enough of those to be called an elliptic equivalent elliptic cohomology theory. To me, the main one is that it's a cohomology theory and it's ring at a point at a suitable twist is a positive energy representation ring at that twist. Okay, so the definition is still the same one as that in your paper, right? <laughs> yes, yes. Any other questions? Hmm. Mm, do you have any idea how to fix a problem you set it, say to make it more geometric? Hmm. Oh, oh, the, this, this one? Yeah, yeah, just do you have some idea to fix the problem? You, you yeah, so, so my, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. my, this, this completion at the level of vector bundles, allowing infinite dimensional vector bundles, that was my, 
my version of the answer. So I don't, I don't know if geometric is the right word, but so, you know, I, I did the completion at the level of vector bundles, as opposed to take the K theory and then just brute force complete. So, yeah, so I guess my claim is that I, my version of the K, twisted K theory does this more geometric completion. I don't know if that's, that's great language, but um, yeah. Mm. So uh, I think, uh, so the new theory will solve the problems in one and two. The first and second problem will be solved with a new theory. Yep. Okay. Yep. Okay, that's good. All four, all four, all four uh, problems are solved. It gives the expected oh. answer, so it does. It gives the right, um, the right level at the right twist. Um, it will always be an elliptic cohomology theory, like it's degree zero apart won't be zero and so you'll get something related to an elliptic curve you'll get like um you know it's degree zero part will be something about theta functions sections of a younger line bundle over the um moduli of g bundles over the tate curve you know that that whole story so you get all that which is basically just the same thing as asking for the degree zero part to be the positive energy representation ring of lg at the correct level so one and two are sort of fixed Honestly, one, two, three, and four are all fixed it by the same thing, which is to allow basically four. If you fix four, then you have one, two, four. So if you have the right the right representations given co-cycles, chances are you're going to get the right thing in degree zero, and then all the other problems are gone. Okay, so will the paper be on archive soon? Um, yeah, so I'm waiting to hear back from the journal before posting the uh, new stuff to the archive. But I think I emailed you the new stuff, right? Actually, maybe, you know what, right after this talk, I'll put uh, the new stuff up. Yeah, I think Sorry, yeah. about maybe two months ago. <laughs> that, that's the newest version, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay, so if there's no more question, let's send the speaker again. Thank you very much. Thank you for hosting and organizing, by the way. Mm -hmm.